you could say today's video is a part two or continuation of my video from the other day that I did last. I spent the last two days reading up on some more things and I'm glad I did because I actually found some stuff that was a little bit more important. It kind of ties it all together like an explanation on how that could even be possible, what I was talking about before. So I started off by doing some more research on like, you know, how big is the internet of things? Like how expansive is it? And to my surprise, it's huge. So I was reading about, you know, the internet of medical things. Uh, so it's I-O-M-T. And they pretty much were talking about how everything is going to go into the cloud and how AI is learning from all of this, learning to <laughs> predict illness or epidemics, I guess, before they happen. So after reading up on some of that stuff, you guys can find this all on the net. And I encourage you all to look it up. For yourselves just so that you can see for yourself that this is totally 100% for real but learning about the internet of medical things next led me to something called the internet of behaviors and the internet of bodies. Very uh, interesting stuff there. So essentially when he did say anything that can be connected will be connected, he was 100% telling the truth. And, you know, I didn't really dig real deep into some of this stuff because some of it seems a little unrealistic to me, but it's always good to have an open mind and check stuff out for yourself. So back to this um, internet of bodies. Their reasoning for doing so, doing this, is, you know, for the benefit of our health. And it is definitely possible with the technology and G and up. So let me just show you a couple of things that I was reading about. Now remember guys, you all you have to do is go on DuckDuckGo. You can type in the header of these legitimate medical research articles and find them yourselves.
So just think for a second. How long now have they been normalizing technology where it tracks your, for example, fitness level, like the fitness wearables, it tracks how many steps you take, even down to your cell phone tracking health status, pacemakers, heart monitors, wireless connecting to the internet, big medical data. This is the next step, the next level, a whole nother level, I should say. But let me just show you this clip. In the century, wireless technology integrated with the human body was nothing more than science fiction. But today, Wi-Fi connected devices like heart rate monitors and sleep trackers have become common parts of American life. How has bionic technology evolved so quickly from science fiction to reality? And what could this internet of bodies mean for our lives moving forward? Brand researchers are studying this phenomenon and what consumers and policymakers need to know as we veer into uncharted territory. The Internet of Bodies, or IOB, is, um, is actually an ecosystem. It's a bunch of devices that are connected to the Internet that contain software and that either collect personal health data about you or can alter the body's function. We think of the Internet of Bodies as this collection of all these devices as well as all the data that the devices are gathering about you. And in healthcare, it's Internet of Bodies has, has been around for quite a while. With the advent of the internet, it makes a lot of sense to connect your pacemaker to the internet so that your doctor can be automatically notified if, if something weird happens, if there's an anomaly. It's natural in a lot of ways to want to understand more about your body, how it functions, how well it's doing. IOB devices could revolutionize healthcare. Unprecedented amounts of personal health data could inform treatment plans that are completely tailored to a patient's needs. There are pills now that have an electronic sensor that let a healthcare provider know whether you have taken the medication. Other things like precision medicine. So precision medicine is the idea of of creating pharmaceuticals or treatment like specifically for your body, for your personalized treatment. And I think IOB could really help with that because nowadays a lot of healthcare is, is based more on, you know, average reactions. Whereas with data from IOB devices, you might be able to, to really more precisely treat a certain disease. But the internet of bodies won't be a cure-all. In fact, the largely unregulated market poses risks to the uniquely sensitive data these devices collect. First of all, there's there's the cyber risk of, of uh, you know, of an actor potentially um, hacking into the system, whatever it might be. There's the privacy risk of all this data that's being collected and the regulations about that data are, are really murky at the moment. And so there's not a lot of clarity into who owns the data, what happens to it, who it gets sold to, how it's being used. And there's even potentially national security and global security risks. A few examples of these risks have already played out in real life. For instance, in 2018, highly sensitive information about US military activity and base locations was inadvertently revealed by soldiers' fitness trackers. So this is a pivotal moment. What can we do to make sure we reap the potential benefits of the Internet of Bodies without risking our privacy, security, and personal autonomy? Consumers should be wary of IOB devices because as it's becoming more and more popular, all of this intimate data is being collected, arguably more intimate data than we've ever really recorded before. There's no clarity on what is being done with that data. You know, with, a, with an old mechanical pacemaker, there's no data that, that was being collected and stored. And you, you know, you could look at a history of someone's um, heart rhythms. Because policy tends to lag behind innovative technologies like this, it's probably up to the consumers and to the, the healthcare patients to really be aware of the devices that they're using and what 
is happening to their data and to, to know what the regulations are in their particular state because it does vary so much state by state. Even if you think you're not interesting or that nothing will happen with your data, there are a lot of unknowns that I think we need to be careful about. So now that you've seen that interesting little clip, um, I want to move on to my next subject. My next subject is, so how does all this work? There's a missing link. Well, I found some more interesting things. So this biosensor or system, whatever you want to call it, has many uses. I encourage you all to read up about it. You'll find lots of interesting things, more than what I can tell you in a 15 minute video. But anyways, um, it's delivery. is through lipid nanoparticles so that the body doesn't reject it. Where have we heard that term before? So this system, or biosensor, whatever you want to call it, is considered to be mRNA. So you know I had to do a little bit more digging, especially with the way it was delivered. Get a pen and paper so that you can write down the number of these patents and look them up yourselves. Here's what I found. So now that you saw that and how this tiny little molecular device can electrically connect you to things to monitor your bo bodily data. Almost sounds like it's coming out of a sci-fi movie, huh? But nothing surprises me these days. I don't believe in coincidences. And if you haven't yet read the infrastructure bill, I urge you to do so as well. You can read up on these articles as well. All you have to do is use the DuckDuckGo app. Just type in the heading and it'll pull it up. So, just going to cut this video short because it's already probably running into like 15 minutes. For those of you that are still with me watching, I'm going to leave you a couple little tidbits after I go of some of the articles that I read. You guys take care, enjoy the rest of your Friday night, and I'll see you soon. See ya.